Hey, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium's evening lecture series. Tonight's program is a walk on the wild side, exploring the ocean floor with digital technology. We're going to explore the ocean with remotely controlled vehicles tonight. Surprisingly, we know more about space than we do about our deep oceans. But recent advances in digital technology are allowing us to learn more about the deep, deep ocean floor than ever before. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Tom Kwasnitschka, and I'm very proud of myself for being able to say that properly. Uh, his research focuses on robotic exploration of deep ocean environments, uh, particularly in the field of volcanology, of seamounts, and very deep explosive volcanism. Tom is a visiting scholar at Ocean Networks Canada, and he's been a research at the Geomar Helmholtz Center for Ocean Research, Kiel, since 2007. Uh, and before I ask Tom to come on up, I would like to thank uh, our supporter tonight, Ocean Networks Canada, for uh, supporting the event and uh, being our partner and bringing our speaker here tonight. Uh, so, Tom, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much for inviting us today here. I'm here with couple of colleagues from ONC. Let's just dive right in. Um, I'd like to start our little trip to the seafloor with some thinking of why we go there. Um, and let's start our presenting device. Let's start with a little comic that many ocean researchers actually have in their office hanging. Um, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I don't. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the ultimate form of ignorance and indifference, actually. Um, it's okay to not care about something, but you should better have a reason. And then you can choose not to care about it. What makes matters worse is that most people know actually so little that they just say the ocean is a big body of water. And that's actually what we look at most of the times when we look at a map of our planet. We focus on the continents, that's where we live. And all the big blue expanse, that's where the ocean is, that's where it's boring, that's where we get our fish, and that's what we have to cross if we don't take a plane, but other than that, well, it starts to matter as soon as we take away the water and look at the surface of our planet that is beneath. And that is actually 72% of our planet's solid surface. It just happens to be covered by water. And that is the ocean floor. And there are a lot of hazards, but also riches and resources. And not, at the end of things, stories to be told about this place. And this is one of the many great things that we try to do at Ocean Networks Canada, I would say. So let's look at this in a slightly different way. This is a histogram of the Earth's elevation. And so it is basically summing up all the heights that we have on our planet. On a very far left, that's the Marianas Trench, the very deep areas where James Cameron went with his sub. Right above me here, that's where you would find Mount Everest and the hilltops of the Himalayas and Andes and the Alps and the like. And what you notice is that we have surprisingly little very deep trenches and very high mountains. And the other thing you notice is that we only live in this part here. That's land. This is where sea starts just over 70%. And you could pretty much take away that number from the black and white image before. But the interesting part about this is that just because it's covered by water doesn't mean that it's just a bit of water and that's it. No, most of our planet is actually deep sea, between 2,000 and 6,000 meters. If you look at that, it's, it's round about 60% that is actually hard to get to. It's really that remote and inaccessible. So it takes a lot of logistical 
and that also means political effort to go there. Why would we want to do so? Well, we take a lot of food out of the ocean. Um, we have to cope with a number of hazards arising from earthquakes or underwater landslides that could cause us tsunamis on shore. At the same time, we take a lot of energy from our oceans and the oceans govern, govern our weather. So there are a lot of compelling reasons to know more about this place. And Ocean Networks Canada is a centralized Canadian body to do so. The, the mission of Ocean Networks Canada is to, to host and curate all the different ocean science data sources that arise from Canadian sources and also partnering ones. It started out with two cabled observatories um, around and off Vancouver Island that I will talk about in a second. But in the meantime, it's grown to be much more than that. Um, it's much bigger than that. That's why it's called Ocean Networks Canada. Um, very soon, there will be a number of smaller observatories installed along the Pacific coast. Many others are in the project phase. So it is, it is really a nationwide effort. But it's not just about hosting data. It's not just one big server. Um, it is also about maintaining much of this infrastructure. And um, we will come to that in a minute. So I said there is a cabled observatory. There's a cable running from Vancouver Island out in the, into the Pacific. Well, why would you want to do such a thing? The oceans are changing. For a long time, we thought, OK, this is a barren place with little life that hardly ever changes. A few sea, cum sea cucumbers are always going to be around in the deep sea, and that's going to be it. Well, it turns out to be that um, the deep sea does change a lot, not only in hot spots like um, mid-oceanic ridges. Whenever you go there with a ship, you find something different. So in order to really understand these environments, like any environment on land, you have to have a permanent presence there. And the best way to do this is today, right now, to run a cable down there. But where to do that? Um, ideally, you would want to cover the entire ocean. Well, we cannot run cables across all the world ocean. So you would want to pick a spot where, with the least amount of cable on the seafloor, you would get the most science out of it. So you would want to go through a place that shows you a lot of diversity and all the different settings that you could encounter on the bottom of the ocean. And off Vancouver Island just happens to be such a place. So if we draw some geological interpretation in this seafloor image, we can see that the oceanic plate, let's for a moment say the Pacific plate, is being subducted beneath the North American plate. So the, the ocean dives down onto the continent, under the continent. At the same time, the oceanic plate is quite, yeah, quite complex in its makeup because it is actually, it is, it is actually um, spreading in, right in the vicinity. So usually you think about the mid-oceanic ridge, that's where the ocean bottom is created, and then there's a long expanse, and somewhere at the continental margins, the plate will be consumed again. Well, right here, we have the spreading ridge pretty much 100 kilometers offshore, and um, in geological time, soon enough, the ridge itself is going to be subducted. So what we are looking here at is the Juan de Fuca plate, which is a smaller oceanic plate. The actual Pacific plate starts to the west of it. So just going off Vancouver Island, you would cover the continental slope, the abyssal plain, and then rather soon hit the oceanic 
rich in. That is what the Neptune Observatory actually covers. And I'm only going to talk about one of these nodes. Basically, what, what happens is the cable does a number of bus stops on its way over the ocean floor. And we are going to talk about just this one here, the Endeavour node tonight, which is where I do my work. So when I prepared this talk, I realized I had actually never seen the cable. This is what it looks like. And what makes matters worse, I just realized that I forgot it up in the office. But I can tell you that it is um, about two centimeters thick. thick and um, it, um, yeah, since I, since I didn't bring it, I'm going to save time on this part. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, at the end of this cable is actually not another country, but scientific instruments. Um, and looking at where we installed this, this is, the in, this is the Endeavor Ridge. And the cable runs, it's a bit hard for me right now, it, it runs roughly in that direction. Let me get the cable in here. And um, it actually, th that thing you just saw, that cable doesn't connect to all the instruments in a daisy-chained way. It's more a cascading approach. So the thick cable um, is sent into a hub and out comes a little thinner cable, which then is easier to manage on the actual seafloor because you want to place it exactly where you want it and not on some, some, some sort of active volcano. Then you end up at another hub. The cable comes in here. And this is where the actual scientific instruments are going to be plugged into using things like these here. And, uh, oh, I think we actually come to this in a minute because I can show you how it actually works to plug these in. Um, at the end of this cable, we have a number of different instruments, water temperature, water samplers, video cameras, current measurements. Um, the actual instruments may look like this. Here you have a water sampler. Um, this is actually a multifunctional instrument doing a, a number of different things. We also have currently installed a number of autonomous systems which we plan to link together with other cables in a few years time, add some more instruments and at the end of the day this is to say this is really a busy place. It is not just one instrument that we have down there at the end of the cable but a multitude that are serviced, added and exchanged every summer. So this is actually how we install these instruments. We use diving robots, so-called ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. They are tied to a big winch and lowered down two and a bit kilometers onto the seafloor. And um, basically what they are is two hydraulic arms a bunch of cameras and a bit of flotation and thrusters. Um, this is actually a scene of where you can see um, we are plugging in a device. There you see the plug and I brought you one just to show you what they're like. So just to get you an idea of how big that claw actually is. They, those arms are bigger than a normal human arm. And uh, in here are two power lines and four fiber optic connectors to do the data transfer. It's pretty sturdy, very deep sea proof. If you think this would actually be great for my garden because it's probably weatherproof. Let me tell you, you'll have to dig deep into your pocket. I'm holding $25,000 in my hand. That gives you another perspective of the kind of specialty um, or the, the special operation that we do down there.
at the end of the day, what the scientists get is very comfortable. They can browse rather than going to sea and all the hardship connected with that. They can sit at home on their computer, browse a website where all their data in the ideal case shows up, is downloadable and usable for them and their colleagues. So what are hydrothermal vents then? Why did we actually go there? Well, let's look at the geology for a moment. This is the Endeavour Ridge, again, in a bit of a different perspective. This is the axial valley where the seafloor spreading happens. The seafloor spreads apart at a rate of about six centimeters per year. So every year, six centimeters of seafloor are added. The valley gets wider. That's why it's symmetrical. Let's look at it from the side. This is a diagram showing not quite the side that we are talking about, but it gets the point across. You get magma rising up to about two or three kilometers beneath this trench. And that's where it starts heating up the crust and also the water trickling in from the side through cracks. You can imagine that these areas are lineated with fissures and faults that allow water to percolate in. The water gets heated up and as it heats up, it starts to leach and dissolve metals and minerals out of the rock. The waters get focused above the magma lens and then exit the seafloor back into the ocean. And as these fluids, as we call them, then mix, they trigger a chemical reaction so that the minerals actually precipitate again. That's what you see as black smoke. It's all those dissolved minerals and sulfur metal compounds precipitating again. And 5% of what you see coming out of black smoke, roughly 5%, is actually building up these chimney structures on the seafloor. My colleague John Jameson counted for the Endeavour segment the amount of chimneys that are down there and he counted 582, I believe, active or extinct, uh, extinct chimney sites there. And uh, we commonly group them into five major vent areas which are active right now and we are going to talk about this one, the southernmost, in a minute. First of all, I'd like to show you a few pictures of what this actually looks like down there. So this is the seafloor. We are following one of these crevasses there where water might trickle into, but most of this area is volcanic rock, lava. This is a drowned lava lake, but you don't just find lava. Um, you also see these brownish, yellowish colors. That is the sulfite that originates from the black smoker vents, the towers that stand high up to 35 meters tall on the seafloor, venting this hydrothermal fluid, the black smoke. And they are covered by a profusion of life, feeding of the thermal and chemical energy of these places. These are, by the way, the only biological images that I will show you um, because I am actually specializing in maps. So I'm, I, I would say I'm, I'm a map maker, but not of the sort that you would put on a piece of paper. It's more about the mental map, about knowing your way around a place and this can happen in a variety of ways. There are basically two ways in which we map the seafloor, two techniques. The first one is acoustically. It happens, it works pretty much like ultrasonics at your doctor. We send sound out into the water onto the seafloor and by the direction and the intensity and the travel time of the echo and with a bit of smart computing behind it, we can then derive the shape 
of the ocean floor. And we do that either with ships or in this case with autonomous drones called autonomous, autonomous underwater vehicles. The other option is to do it optically and that is what I do most of the time. Um, to illustrate that, I brought you a little example that doesn't have to do with geology, but it makes things more clear. Um, this, is a, uh, this is an archaeological site. This is a drowned Maya pot in a submerged Mexican cenote, an underwater cave. A diver went around this pot and took images, so I don't just have this one. I actually have several of these images from every direction. And the computer takes these images now and looks for features that is well recognizable points in the image or on the object, for example, the handle or a characteristic crack. And the computer asks, can I find this feature in other images of my data set? And with a bit of triangulation, you can then derive the 3D shape of all these features in, or the position in 3D space. Not only that, you can also derive the position of the camera as it took the image. And that is depicted with these little squares there. So once you've got that, you can then triangulate between the points and come up with what we call a three-dimensional mesh, a three-dimensional surface, which pretty much already is our three-dimensional object that we want to study. We can also use the position of the cameras relative to this object to use them as virtual slide projectors if you want so and throw the texture back onto this model to get as good a digital representation of our object as we can hope for. And then of course we can explore this um, at leisure, take all the time we want which we wouldn't have on the seafloor. So let's look at how we employed this technique down here in Mothra to actually come up with the data for the exhibit that you've just seen out in the hallway. This is a very well studied site. It was discovered in 1986 and an extensive survey was done 10 years later when um, it was actually visited for the first time, 1996, the first dive down there, 1997. This map was made, and it was made using acoustical methods, the top technology of the day, which gave a resolution of about 50 to 20 centimeters. Great, but still improvable. Um, they also shot an extensive set of images. They were later stitched together to a panorama and for the better part of a decade, these images served as the role model of what you could do to visualize hydrothermal edifices on the seafloor. Um, our colleagues at the University of Washington in the meantime were kind enough to provide us with the original imagery. We ran them through the computer and ended up with a three-dimensional model of the same area from the same data that we can now fly around and actually study. So this has a photographic texture on it. We can actually look at each individual spider crab that was alive at this time. Not only that, this was just a small area that was surveyed. In the meantime, other colleagues extended the acoustic map so we wouldn't just look at this very specific point on the, on, on the spreading axis, this specific vent field, but they made a map at one meter resolution of the entire Endeavour Ridge segment um, on to which we can now superimpose this higher resolution model. This, but this still is 16 year old data. In the meantime, the camera technology improved as well. Now we are looking at full HD or 4K digital cameras even. And if you look at a modern diving robot, it still has these two hands, but 
most of the rest of it is actually cameras and lights. Using this, we re-ran the survey in just two and a half hours. The first one I should have mentioned lasted 65 hours. They were doing other stuff as well, but um, the, the essence of it we were now able to capture quite quickly in color and at a resolution between one and five centimeters. So may, you may ask, this is all very nice and entertaining, but what's the science behind it? I mean, we don't do this for Hollywood, we do this for science. Well, one thing you can do is compare the changes. This is the 16-year-old data set. If you superimpose the data of last year, you can see that some of the chimneys have grown. This one, for example, or these two, this one, this one as well. Whereas, on the other hand, some have disappeared. There is no yellow spike up here, and there is none here. Well, that's because they've gone to the surface. They've been sampled in 1998 um, for scientific purposes, but eventually they made their way into the American Museum of Natural History, at least some of them. I recommend visiting their exhibit. It is very stunning to see they actually have a real black smoker chimney there on display. These are the kinds of things that we can not just detect, but actually quantify. We can tell now how much volume of black smoker sulfide has been removed. What we end up doing here is we are drawing change maps. This is an older version of such a change map, but it illustrates well what we are trying to do. Um, these are time series from 91, 94, and 95. And you can see that uh, in this drawing made by hand from visually looking at imagery and out of a sub, that on these three time slices, both the venting changes, the shape of the edifice changes, and the colors also tell you that the settlement on this chimney underwent a lot of change. And our hope is, our expectation is, that using these digital technologies, we will soon be able to actually let the computer draw these comparisons for us, and hopefully on a much bigger scale. Another aspect of this work is that uh, it is very important to monitor hydrothermal chimneys especially, and hydrothermal fields, because right now they undergo interest, or they're subject to interest from the mining industry, and there you basically have a classic avatar story. You have the supposedly bad mining companies trying to destroy this supposedly pristine place. We hope that this technology will put the discussion on a sober ground and let us see what is actually down there, what needs to be saved, what might be allotted for mining. I have a very neutral opinion on all of this, uh, but in next March we are going to a totally different place on the other end of the Pacific Ocean, um, here in the northeastern Lao Basin between Fiji and Samoa. And we are going to survey an entire black smoker field and its surroundings. This place is called Nihua. It's 500 meters across. And in here on these little mounds um, are not so little 36 major hydrothermal chimneys and hundreds of smaller ones. And using the technology that I've just shown to you, we will get a digital model of this entire area. Why? because it might, it just might be mined one day in the not so distant future. How can you participate in all of this exciting research? Well, through telepresence. What does that mean? Usually when we go to sea, we don't go down into the deep ourselves. As you've just seen, we use these diving robots and we operate them from elaborate mission control rooms plastered with monitors. The pilots sit in the first row. Some chosen few scientists are with them in the van directing the survey. Well, when I was doing 
the two and a half hour color survey, I wasn't even on the ship. This is what my mission control room looked like. It was seven in the morning. I had just woken up through an SMS from the ship. I was in my pajamas, barely making it with a coffee to my desk. And we were running the survey. I was Skyping with the pilots, talking to the pilots as they were running the survey with me. How is that possible? Well, we are hauling out a tremendous amount of satellite communication and broadcasting equipment to see to enable us to stream high def video over the, over the satellite back to shore and likewise also receive a certain amount of communication back from the scientists ashore. So now we're in the position where not everybody still has to go to sea in order to be effective, especially working with these sorts of robotics. I mean, at the end of the day, I didn't have to look at a specific kind of rock. I basically looked at the video and told the pilots more to the left, more to the right, or you can go faster or slower. Everything else, of course, was prearranged. For you, that means whenever there is an expedition like that, you can log on to a website like Ocean Networks Canada and browse to their live streaming video page, look at the video, and even you can submit questions, not by talking to the pilots directly, I'm afraid, but you can type your questions and um, an educator will usually pick them up within the matter of hours. So this is something that we always, we always get into the ROV control when questions from students um, of any level and the general public. Still pretty impressive, but it's not walking on the seafloor. It's watching the seafloor through a tiny porthole in two dimensions. Wanting to walk on the seafloor is actually something that geologists have wanted for a long time. And let me briefly tell you what it is a geologist does when he goes or she goes into the field. Geologists are still this sort of romantic bunch of natural scientists who actually go out and look at the phenomena that they study, at least the field geologists. Um, what happens if they do? Well, they stand in a valley, gentle slopes, forested, which means most of the rock outcrops will be covered anyway. But hey, there is a stream flying through this little valley, which has cut into the earth, uncovering this strata of volcanic ash and created this little ledge on which my three colleagues stand. If they take one step further, they will fall down. And there's not just one guy. They are in a small group. They are talking to each other. They're taking notes. They might chop away a bit at the rock to get an opinion of what the fabric is. And they will exchange their views on what made up this deposit. This is how geological field work works relative to your own presence and your own senses. As you've seen, this doesn't quite work in the deep sea. We are staring for hours on end on monitors that don't give us this 3D information, the stereoscopic information that we would get from our own eyes. When we are back in the lab, a colleague might see something totally different in these videos than you have seen, and then you start arguing. And when you're back on land, you don't have the opportunity to turn your head left or right again. Actually, turning your head left or right involves telling the pilot, can you please turn the camera or the actual vehicle left or right? And believe me, you do that five times, and then you stop doing it, unless it's really necessary. So with all this given technology that we embrace, we are still not all the way with what we want to achieve. But we have these new, for example, photogrammetric high resolution data sets coming up. And our idea at my home institution was let's do something at the back end. Let's come up with a projection and dissemination device that would make full 
use of this new kind of data. And so I set out and built this simulator. It's much like a holodeck if you watch Star Trek. Um, it's a six meter diameter bowl, it's not a box. And we project, virtually project um, the seafloor onto this. We can do Google Earth kind of flyovers over the entire world if we choose to do so. This is for example Mount St. Helens. But at the same time, we can also load the seafloor in the same simulation. So I, I can seamlessly fly from Mount St. Helens all the way across the globe here onto the Menes Gwen hydrothermal field on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and pull up a simulation of hydrothermal fluid, black smoke, rising a couple hundred meters above the seafloor. All of this is possible in this simulator. And I hope I will be able to show you some of the impressions from this place. So it's actually, I think, quite small, just seven meters in diameter, a room within a room. You can imagine building a new lab at an institution that isn't always easy. Um, every time I have new people in, I take them straight to the Grand Canyon to show them what it is that we are trying to achieve the Grand Canyon is brimming with three-dimensional geological information. You can actually see all the strata. You can correlate the left and the right and the front and the back. And this is why it's actually a hemispherical shape, a bowl, a dish. You can make out the geometrical relations of things. I'm controlling that with a little six degree of freedom mouse. I can fly wherever I want at will. So it makes things very swift and easy. And one very important component is that I try to never be alone in there. I always take colleagues. Actually, big surprise, up to four like in a normal field excursion. And whatever happens in there, we always start talking about what we see. So the, the least thing this does for us is catalyzing the discussion that we have among scientists right now. Here you see us discussing the details of a photogrammetric model of some volcanic outcrop in the Cape Verdes. That was my PhD thesis. This is where we're at right now. We are right now in the phase of collecting more data to bring into our simulator to make our simulator better to justify more data from the sea. So it's a, it's a circle that will hopefully bring us to a fantastic end result. We do hope that um, we can make this thing smaller, more wearable, more field proof. Probably not like this, but we are trying to bring it into a shape where it will come natural to us. I mean, 50 years ago, we were using paper and pencil. Now we are using these fancy machines. Maybe in a few years from now, we will just don a little device and blend our reality with a virtual reality and start walking on the seafloor. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much, Tom. So we have time for uh, two questions, and then uh, we're going to go, for anyone who's interested in going back to the exhibit with us, we'll go back as a group, and we'll just meet right out here in the reception area. So uh, does anyone have a question for Tom before, uh, before we head out? OK, so I'll walk over there. and. Uh, The terrestrial mapping you have of the Grand Canyon there, have you uh, paired that with any paleontologists and found any stuff? This is the best part of it. Um, anybody can do this. The software we are using, we haven't written it. It's called Worldwide Telescope. It was started by Microsoft Research. It is free and it accesses the Bing Maps engine and the Microsoft Bing Maps servers. So, no, we haven't, because it's not our field of study, but anybody could. Sorry, you said you were using 4K cameras. I was just wondering, 
um, if the work that you're doing mapping would be, um, if you'd be able to do it quicker and more efficiently if you're using uh, higher resolution cameras or if you had higher frame rates available or if that's just limited by the optics of uh, photography underwater. That's a cosmos of aspects that occupy most of my days. Um, <laughs> so, um, to be clear, we are going to use 4K cameras in March. Right now we are using HD video, not because I like it so much, but because it's the most readily available and the least prone to not working. Um, the best, I w if, I, if I could, if it would rain deep sea cameras, I would pick the 20 megapixel crisp still photography camera that gives me two frames a second. This thing isn't out there and you're perfectly right. Underwater optics in the deep sea are a nightmare to get right. And there are many products out, but if you do photogrammetry, it gets really hard. One message to take home here is a problem that we are facing with visual surveys is that people tend to say, oh, I can see this myself. I don't need a computer because it's right there. We have to treat cameras on ROVs as a measurement device. They're a scientific instrument that needs calibration, maintenance, and special care. If we don't do this, we don't get results. We might get results at 100 times the effort back in the lab, but they're not guaranteed. And that's part of our daily struggle. All right, thank you very much, Tom, for coming and giving us that presentation tonight. I uh, just wanted to let everybody know uh, that our next public program is, uh, is a symposium on saving critically endangered frogs, and it's on October 22nd. And I'd like to once again thank OceanWorks Canada for coming out tonight and supporting our event. So thank you very much and have a good night.